Hello, I'm Jennifer Martin. I'm delighted today to be at the home of Dr. Susanna Ward, who's our chair of the Member Wellbeing and Health Committee. So what was it about the committee that uh, got you interested in joining and uh, what do you hope to achieve? Oh, I've been very passionate about this space ever since I was a trainee. Um, and so I just, you know, would love to be a part of these discussions and share my knowledge and insights and things like that. I'm very passionate that doctors' wellbeing is important or well, crucial. <laughs> um, and it's just lovely to be a part of a group where we can work together and make improvements in the culture. And what, what are those improvements? So if you're um, trying to make like two or three big improvements in culture around well-being. What is it uh, you think that uh, would make the biggest change? Oh, that's a big question. Um, I think ultimately it's about culture change. Yeah. We need to have a more nurturing and supportive culture for doctors and trainees. And that means um, doctors having skills in uh, interpersonal relationships, and managing uh, difficult conversations, skills in teaching so that there's no, um, you know, teaching through humiliation or criticism, but rather this love of learning and curiosity and a focus on the patient and what they need as opposed to trainees feeling they need to jump through hoops and prove their worth. Um, I think that ultimately, you know, you can work a really hard job that's very onerous and demanding, but if you have a supportive network, a team that works together and you feel safe in that environment, you can thrive. Part of this culture change has to focus on safety. So it needs to be thinking about workplace physical safety, but also psychological safety and identifying well, what are the key drivers that are really um, challenging doctors' well-being at work and how can we target evidence-based interventions to improve them and particularly looking at making sure that everyone can come to work and feel safe, that they're going to have the support and resources they require to meet the demands. Some of, the, some of these issues are around our actual physical workplace and the college doesn't have uh, so much jurisdiction over that because the college doesn't employ people into the hospital. But what sort of things can the college do, do you think, to ensure that our workplaces are understanding that there's stressful places for our trainees, there's stressful places for our fellows, and uh, how do we use uh, soft um, uh, encouragement uh, to the workplaces to ensure that they're aware that uh, our doctors need to be looked after when they're in the workplace? I look, I think just having these discussions and being honest about what's happening, communicating with the trainees, the doctors at work, um, it, maybe the college could consider measuring well-being of their members or looking at ways of doing that through other organisations. Uh, just continue to advocate in this space for a standard of, of practice. Um, and I know that there is a lot of work being done through the CPAC committee with the new college focus around workplace advocacy. Um, and then collaborating with other colleges and we've seen that internationally with uh, colleges coming together to have a united voice about culture change. Um, one of the emerging roles that you're seeing more internationally, and we talked about it at the Wellbeing Advocates webinar, is the Chief Medical Wellness Officer role. And that's something that I think colleges should be advocating more of. It's a distinct role that's paid, uh, held by a clinician that understands the frontline issues that is paid to specifically address workplace factors that contribute to burnout. Um, I think seeing more roles like that in Australia is really going to help because it is a lot of work uh, and it's high level work and these people need to be skilled and trained in it with the appropriate resources they need to, to do the work. So that's a potential role for the college then, isn't it? To, to advocate for the wellbeing officers uh, in the hospital setting. Um, because I've heard a lot of people have said that the hospitals are not really all that supportive of the wellbeing officers. Uh, they're funded for uh, units of care or number of operations or number of patients we move through the system. And actually for a wellbeing officer, there's quite a bit of work to convince the workplace that this is a good investment um, of a salary. Yeah, and, and that was one of the key takeaways of the web webinar is that you really do need executive buy-in to get the funding for the role. Mm -hmm. 
Um, but also it's, it's a best practice benchmark. And really, if organizations and hospitals want to be taking well-being seriously, then this is the sort of investment that's required to improve things. And I think, you know, now is the time to really be taking this seriously. Um, we're seeing higher rates than ever of burnout and you know, huge dropout rates in the NHS. And we want to get on top of this. Um, there's been tragedies in the past. So as much as well-being is a positive thing, where doctors should be flourishing in all aspects of their lives, what we're actually dealing with in many contexts of work is unsafe practices or doctors struggling. Um, and we don't want that. <laughs> well, it's not good for patients, is it? We know that when no. doctors aren't well, it really impairs patient care. Absolutely. Um, you know, it, we know that burn burnout is twice more likely to be associated with patient safety incidents, um, uh, lower patient outcome measures, uh, lower rates of professionalism, which is then a cultural safety issue. Uh, it's associated with uh, absenteeism and intention to leave and the workforce shortage, which then you know, perpetuates the vicious cycle around unsafe workplaces and demands exceeding resources. So it's so important, but also, you know, the health and well-being of ourselves and each other is just as important as those of our patients. Yes. And we have a duty of care to look after each other and ourselves to, to be able to care for our community. So I think that it is so important also because it's changeable. Like a lot of these cultural issues and workplace issues can be reformed. And so if we can do this, then we must. And yes, it takes time. Um, culture change is slow, but I think as long as we're having honest conversations in a really compassionate collegiate way, which I was very pleased to see happen during the webinar, the Wellbeing Advocate web webinar, as long as we're addressing these issues and seeing them, then we are altering the outcome. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Ward, for inviting me to your beautiful home today in a beautiful part of uh, The Hunter and uh, for making time to have this incredible conversation about where we are culturally, what we need to do in the college to change and um, <clears throat> how we can use our, our soft power and our advocacy mm. to really ensure that we can make uh, changes uh, in the workplace. So yeah, thank you so much for ensuring that we look after physicians and ensuring that we've got a sustainable work workforce for the future. Pleasure, thank you for coming. It's been wonderful. It's been wonderful. <laughs>